Good morning. How far back in time can we see the universe? You probably all go from time to time outdoors to see the starry night. Do you know that you are looking at the past of the universe? Light takes some time to reach us. It travels 300,000 kilometers a second. And so when you see the sun, it takes eight minutes for the light to travel the space and reach you. When you look at the next closest star, Proxima Centauri, it takes four years for the light to reach you. When you look at the center of the galaxy, if you, can see, you can actually see part of the haze of the, the of a galaxy, the Milky Way, and it takes 25,000 years uh, for that light to reach us. There is, of course, a limit on how far we can, backward in time, we can, we can see the universe, because it's finite in time. There was a Big Bang that occurred 13.8 billion years uh, in the, our past. But there were more fundamental limitations than that. Uh, so I would like to explain to you how far backward or further back in time we can see the universe with different senses and to start with light. The scientific methods to look at the universe through light really started from Galileo Galilei in, at the turn of the 17th century. He perfectioned the telescope and he was able to see much further. Right now we have a lot of very different types of telescopes because light has, has different uh, nature. Um, you know, light ranges from red to violet, but actually, we can s this is only the visible light to humans. Even some animals can see infrared light or ultraviolet light. And if you go more red than infrared, you have um, microwaves, and even more red than that, radio waves. And if you go more violet, you have X-rays, the ones that you see at the hospital, uh, to, to check your bones, or gamma rays, that are very dangerous rays because they are very energetic and can destroy cells. All the spectrum is called electromagnetic spectrum, but I will just call it light. When you study the universe using all the forms of light, there is a fundamental limit. In 1964, Penzias, a uh, phys physicist and Wilson, a radio astronomer, installed an antenna for measuring radio, uh, sorry, microwaves um, coming from the cosmos. And there was a noise that they could not remove. That noise did not come from the instrument, it did not come from the Earth, nor from the Sun, nor from the galaxy, it came from the entire universe. And at the same time, theorists explained to them what it could be. In the early stages of the universe, the universe was opaque to light. So light was traveling and was hitting matter, and it could not travel straight. But when the universe slowly cooled down, expanded, at some point, atoms were created, and light decoupled from matter, and light started to travel straight. And that light traveled the universe and is still reaching us today. That's the light that Penzias, Penzias and Wilson discovered um, in 1964. That light comes from this decoupling time between light and matter that occurred around 370,000 years after the Big Bang. That's the further that we can see with light, because before that time, the universe was opaque. Of course, now um, astronomers are still developing new instruments to see the closest uh, stars. Uh, earlier in time, we can see right now the first galaxies 200 million years after the Big Bang. And we can aim to see the first stars that lit up around one million years after the Big Bang. But you cannot see further than this uh, cosmic uh, background um, uh, that Penzias and Wilson found. So this, this light, that was decoupled from the beginning of the universe, um, uh, actually um, came to us, but since the universe is expanding, that light became more red and more red through time, 
and so it became infrared and then microwave. This is why right now it's a microwave background that we can observe. There are many interesting things still also we can find with light, like exoplanets and uh, many other, thing, um, other objects. But now let me go through, um, through other senses to probe the universe. We can also, in a sense, smell the universe. So in 1914, Victor S. flew a balloon and went in the upper atmosphere. And he found there were many particles out there, much more than on the ground. This particle, the explanation, is that there was a high energy particle hitting the atmosphere coming from outer space called a cosmic ray. And when it hits the atmosphere, a shower of particles came. That shower of particles is the one that he, that he detected. In a sense, it's a, it's a smell because when you see all these particles, it's not clear what is the origin of, of, of that triggered it. Like a bad smell in a room, it's not clear to point to where it came from. This discovery triggered many, uh, many discoveries of particles physics. Much later on, uh, a special particle was found with the smallest mass, the one that, that we know with the smallest mass, called neutrino. A neutrino, different than a neutron, uh, that constitute the normal matter. A neutrino is a very light particle that travels nearly at the speed of light. And at this moment, a lot of neutrinos are passing through you and through the room, and nobody noticed them. Actually, they pass even through the entire Earth without really interacting with it. These neutrinos also interacted a lot with matter at the early stages of the universe. And at some point in the history of the universe, it became transparent to neutrinos. And that occurred one second after the Big Bang. So if today we could observe all these neutrinos arising from this event in the past, we would be able to, to have a picture of the universe, how it was one second after the Big Bang, like we did for the light. But it's very hard to detect because these neutrinos barely interact with matter, so it's a challenge to detect. There's yet another way to probe the universe, to observe it, uh, as you know, um, the best dishes are the ones you make by hand, uh, the homemade ones. And the same is true for particles. If you can create them in your laboratory with uh, complete control about how you create them, you can learn a lot about the universe. You can simulate how the universe was in the early stages, in the first seconds after the Big Bang, and even a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. You don't directly observe that event, but you simulate it using your hands, using tools, using machinery. This is the history of collider physics that started 50 years ago. Right now, the best collider is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Geneva, uh, at the frontier between France and Switzerland. It allows us to recreate the conditions of how the universe was a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, more precisely, one part over a hundred billion of a second. The limitation to see the universe in that way is limited to the size of the, the collider. Right now, the size of the collider is 27 kilometers long. It's a huge um, concentric ring on the ground. If we want to see the universe closer, to, to touch the universe closer to the Big Bang, we will need to build a larger collider. The best sense um, to, to observe the universe, uh, to me, because maybe because I love music, is hearing. And when, um, when I'm talking about sound, I'm talking here about a very different kind of sound than the one that you are listening to right now. The sound that I'm emitting uh, comes from my vocal cords. It's a f it changes the pressure of the air, and that change of pressure of the air is sent to you at 300 meters per second, and it reaches the drum of your ears. And it rests on the fact that there is air around us, and we can modify its pressure. Now, in the outer universe, there's no air, so there's no sound like this. But there's a different type of sound, a different type of wave. Einstein predicted in 1915 that there would be gravitational waves. Gravitational waves are wiggles in the structure of space and time itself, which is a bit hard to imagine, 
Um, but imagine that the space-time is not rigid, and that you can actually make it, uh, make it vibrate. These vibrations go at the speed of light. 100 years after the prediction of Einstein, these gravitational waves were observed for the first time in 2015, only four years ago. These gravitational waves tell us about very energetic events that occurred in the universe and that could not be detected through other senses, through light or through particles. Einstein predicted that it would be at the end state of collapse of very massive stars, a very dense and very compact dark object called the black hole. These objects are the densest ones that we know in nature. When two such black holes close, come close to each other, they orbit each other and finally merge, and they produce a huge amount of these gravitational waves. Around nine billion years ago, two such black holes collided, and the gravitational wave that they emitted reached us, and they were detected by the, the, this instrument, the interferometer, um, four years ago. Um, and what they did, this gravitational wave, what they do is they make small changes of distances, actually smaller than the size of an atom, but it's possible to measure it. You can convert that signal of changing distances, since it's a wave, you can convert it into an audio sound. And so you can, in a sense, hear two black holes collide, and they make this sound that you may have heard of. It's a root sound, uh, which is a very short, uh, it's around uh, a s less than a second. Uh, and this is a new way to sense the universe. In the coming future, there will be plenty of discoveries. There will be new kind of detectors also to extend the range of um, listening to our cosmos in particular with these um, satellites that will be sent by the LISA mission, and that will be able to see the universe way closer, around 300 million years after the Big Bang, and also in a different way. There's no limit, a fundamental limit, to, to, see the, to listen to the universe in this way, because gravitational waves pass through the entire universe. The universe is transparent, and it has always been transparent to gravitation, because it's universal. The only limitation is, again, detection, because the signal is very weak and we need to be able to see it or to listen to it. So here is the picture of how far back in time you can see the universe. There is a fundamental limitation, which is the Big Bang. Using light only, you can see the universe 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And this history of seeing the universe has been lasting for 400 years. More recently in our history, we were able to see, to, to smell and taste the universe with around, um, uh, with particles since 100 years. And we actually, I use the word testing for neutrinos because in fundamental physics, there are three different kinds of neutrinos that are denoted as flavor. So I'm playing a bit with words here that we can taste the neutrinos. Um, the, the touching or creating very high energy particles is actually only a history of 50 years in the humankind. And now, listening to the universe using gravitational waves has only a history of four years. So you can imagine that in the foreseeable future, there will be plenty of new ways that we can, plenty of new improvements that will allow us to improve our understanding of, in a different and complementary ways, on observing the universe. Thank you for your attention.